Good morning again, church. Good morning. Good morning. It's a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord today. And now that we've concluded our topical study, we had a short topical study in the spiritual disciplines. We finished that up last week. And then we now return to an exposition of Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, entitled the series on the Sermon on the Mount, Revolutionary. That's the name of the sermon series. So if you go back through the YouTube and you're looking for the beginning of the series, because remember we stopped it after about six sermons, because the Lord led me to preach on the spiritual disciplines, and now we'll return to that. But it's entitled Revolutionary because this sermon that Jesus preached and taught, it was a revolutionary one. It was nothing like anybody had ever heard before. For so many years, the religious leaders had added to and they had actually twisted the commandments of God out of a desire for piety, out of a desire for holiness. But they also did so secretly because they wanted to wield power over the people. They wanted to, to have, have a, an authority over God's people. Now they had taken what was meant for good, God's law was meant for good, they had taken what was for good and for righteousness and they made their yoke burdensome and unbearable. And so God had given the Pharisees and the Sadducees by law, he had given them an authority position over the people. And he did that to, to demonstrate a godly lesson in submission. So the people would submit to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, and then they in turn uh, submitted to God. So it was a lesson, their authority was a, a lesson in submission. But these prideful men abused and they used their divine authority for ill-gotten gain. That was one of the reasons. And also they wanted a celebrity type status, a certain recognition. They were essentially stealing the honor and the glory that was meant for God alone. That's really what they were doing by doing that. And it's in this backdrop that now Jesus of Nazareth appears on the scene. And with it, he's bringing with him the proper view of the law, the proper meaning and the proper purpose for God's holy law. Now Jesus' message was essentially this. His message was, you have heard it said, or, or by saying that, you've heard it taught this way by these religious hypocrites. But I say to you, here he begins to straighten out what had been made a crooked, a crooked, what had been made crooked by them. And they had kind of bent it out of shape, the law. And he's here now to straighten out what had been bent and crooked. Jesus was actually fulfilling the words of the prophet Isaiah. Long time ago, the prophet had prophesied concerning the coming Messiah. He said this in Isaiah 42, verse 21. He says, the Lord, Yahweh, is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt or he will magnify the law and he will make it honorable. And that's what he did. That's exactly what Jesus did, starting with this great sermon that he preached. He put the holy law under a heavenly microscope so that way the people's eyes could be open to the truth. It's because the truth would set them free. So Jesus wanted them, he wanted them not to fear the law. You see, the law had been wielded kind of as a weapon. And sometimes people can do that with the Bible. They can use that as a weapon against people. <coughs> and it's what the Pharisees had been doing. So, so Jesus, he, he didn't want them to fear the law. He didn't want them to dread the law. But he wanted to see, he wanted them to see what its intended purpose really was. And that's to help them grow spiritually. That's the purpose of the law. It's to help you grow spiritually, to mature. And the law is also to honor their God. It's the purpose behind the law, wanted to honor God. And to show them that they should love and revere God's word and to cling to it tightly. Now, the, the Apostle Paul urges us in Philippians 2.16 the same way. He says this, Apostle Paul urges, hold fast the word of life. In other words, hold tightly to God's word. Cherish God's word. Seek God's word. Because in the law, God's word, the very character and the nature of God is revealed to mankind. I mean, people say, I worship God. I don't need your Bible. I don't need to go to church. Well, how do you know anything about God if you don't read his word? And so that's the purpose. It reveals the character, the nature of God. That's how it's revealed to mankind. And along, it also reveals God's desires for his people. How do you know what God wants from you if you don't read his word? And it's for his people, for those who call upon his name for salvation. 
But these religious leaders, these hypocrites, if you were, they were actually perverting God's word for their own gain. They were using it as a weapon. And Jesus, who's God in the flesh, he's the second member of the triune Godhead, he comes to earth to reveal the truth. And this God-man, the, the God-man Jesus, he, he spoke with divine authority as you read through the Sermon on the Mount. He says it over and over again, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Do you realize how that would have shocked and intrigued his listeners? Who is this man? Who speaks like this? You've heard it said, but I say to you, he's speaking with an authority that no man has spoke with before. This man speaks like no man ever dared speak before because he's saying, this is God's word. You're listening, this is the law of Moses, God's very word, and you're saying, I've heard it said, but you say you're making yourself equal with God and his word? No man never dared speak like that with this kind of authority. Even the court officers, the ones who, who were with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were even astonished. Let me show you what I mean. If you have your Bible, turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, looking at verses number 45 to 52. So John chapter 7, starting at verse number 45. Amen. When you're there, you come through the Gospels. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John chapter 7, starting at verse 45. Amen. 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 Listen to this. It says, Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? Talking about Jesus. They wanted him to arrest him and to bring him before them to give an account of everything he was saying. They said, Why haven't you done that? And look what they say in verse 46. The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. They had never heard anything like so much so they just walked away in amazement. But then they continued. The Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. And then Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night back in chapter 3, being one of the ones that did believe in Jesus, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And in the, these religious leaders, they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? I mean, search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Now, these teachings of the rabbis, these were called their yoke. That's what it's called. Their teachings is called their yoke. That's what it was called. It was their interpretation of the Bible, of the law. And where they had added on extra biblical demands and burdens, which was making the yoke extremely heavy, all of a sudden here comes Jesus. He comes along teaching and preaching and listen to what he says. This is from Matthew 11. He says, come to me, all you who labor, who are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He says, take my yoke, take my teaching, take my interpretation, because it's the correct one, by the way, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, he says, for I am gentle, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, for my yoke, my teaching, my interpretation is easy, and my burden is light. That's Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. So God's people, they were weighed down. They were just being pushed down with guilt, with shame, because of their sin. And instead of offering peace and offering relief, the religious leaders, what they do, they just add an extra burdens upon them. Keep trying harder. Maybe you're not doing this enough. Maybe you're not praying hard enough. Maybe you're not giving enough money. Maybe you're not doing this or doing that. So they start adding in more and more and more. Burdening them even more. Religious leaders had these extra burdens. And by the way, they were extra burdens that even the religious leaders couldn't, couldn't obey themselves. The law had become burdensome, and so what happens? God himself comes to his people to set it straight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, that your word teaches us, it guides us, it instructs us. And now, Lord, as we look into your words, we peer back through the corridors of time to when you sat upon the mountain and you spoke to the people to reveal the truth, to straighten out what had been bent and been made crooked. Help today to straighten out 
our hearts and our minds to the truth. And Father, we thank you today that you have given us your word so that we will know your will and we'll know what you want from us. And we just thank you, Father. We ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So you're in John right now. Go ahead, find your place in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. This great passage of Scripture actually opens with what's called the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. These are nine blessings, if you will. So be called the nine blessings. So we'll be looking, starting at verse number 3 of John of Matthew, chapter 5. Everybody there? Amen. 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 Right. So Matthew 5, starting at verse number 3. Here it is. Jesus begins, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God, of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So here Jesus, what he's doing is he's revealing the heart of the true worshiper. He's revealing the ones who, who honor and worship God with a broken and a contrite spirit. And he reveals the blessings that are actually connected to proper worship, to a proper heart and a proper mind toward God. To receive God's grace, one first has to have a genuine love and a genuine desire for God. That has to be first. And not only a, a genuine love and desire for God, but also for righteousness. You won't righteousness. You want to be holy. You have a genuine desire for that. And then scripture affirm, affirms in 1 Peter 5.5, 5, God will actually resist the proud of heart. Those who say, I don't need the Bible. I don't need the church. I don't even really need God. I can be good on my own. That's a proud heart. And God says that he will resist the proud. But he continues, he gives grace to the humble. So here Jesus is talking about those who are humble of heart, humble of spirit, humble of mind. And then Jesus continues to re reveal not only the heart of the true believers in this first section, but then he moves into our obligation and to our duty. He continues, look at verse 13 through 16. He says, you, speaking to those that are hearing, to believers, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so right off the bat, part of it, once we understand our true heart and how we're supposed to be in worship, then he says he gives us our duty, we're to be like salt. Like salt, you and I are to be preserving agents. We talked about this a few weeks ago, preserving agents, salt stops the rot. And so you and I, as Christians, are to go into the world to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the truth of what God's word says, to stop the moral rot and decay in our culture and our society. And friends, I don't know if you know this, there is a lot of moral rot and decay in our society and our culture today. Yes. And so you and I are that preserving agent. We're to be like salt. And as the light of the world, we're to show the culture and the world the way to be made right with God. How are they going to know? How are they going to know what God wants from them? How are they going to know how to be made right with God if we don't tell them? They're not going to know. They're in darkness. And so we're to be the light, as Jesus says. We are to shine the light of the truth that, by the way, is only found in God's holy word. It's the only place you're going to find truth. And we are to light the way under the path which leads to eternal life. Face it, nobody wants to die. Nobody really does. Nobody wants to take that step into eternity. And if you can offer someone eternal life, what an amazing gift. And so we're to light that way which leads to that eternal life. In short, we're to reveal the true light of God. 
What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's all found in Jesus. So how do we reveal Jesus to the world? It begs the question. By his word. By the holy law of God. That's how we reveal God to the world. The law wasn't just for those people in that place at that time. It's still relevant today. Just as it was then, God's word is still complete, completely relevant for now. You know, it really, that's one of my pet peeves, one of the things that just really gets under my skin when people say, and I hear Christians say this, I hear pastors say this. They'll say, well, you know, how can we make the Bible relevant for people today? What are you talking about? God never changes. It's always relevant. He's eternal, therefore his word is eternal. It's always relevant. So it's not just for those people in that place at that time. His law was eternally binding upon his people. He continues, Matthew 17 to 20. Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law. A lot of people nowadays say, well, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. We don't need the law. But he says, do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. He said, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one little tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. Whoever, therefore, breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, here he is again, speaking with authority no man's ever spoke with before. I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousnesses of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so the law does not make us righteous. It's not what he's saying. The law will not make you righteous. But it reveals the righteous standard of God. It tells us God's standards. To be seen as perfect, what you and I would have to have done to be perfect, because remember, that's God's standard, is perfection. It's not just being okay. It's just not being good enough. You have to be perfect in God's eyes. So to be seen as perfect, you and I would need to have kept God's holy law perfectly in thought, in word, and in deed from the very moment that we popped into this world, the very moment that we were born. I don't know about you, but I have failed in that many, 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 many times. So therefore, I'm not perfect. I have already broken God's law, and I do not live up to his standard. Jesus said, again, if you look back in verse 19, whoever breaks even one of the least of these commandments, even one, even one. And then James, his half-brother, actually parallels this in James 2.10, where James writes, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of breaking them all. How can that be, Pastor? How can it be that I kept the entire law perfectly, but I told one lie? Why will that one lie send me to hell for eternity? That doesn't sound fair. Imagine this. You're climbing up a chain, and it has 100 links. You've passed 99 links successfully. Good job. But that one link above you breaks. It doesn't matter how many you successfully passed. That one link would send you to your doom. Same principle. Because God's standard is perfection, and if you break even one law, you're no longer perfect. You're like me and everybody else. Now, some may argue, again, that's not fair. One single sin, one little transgression, that's going to stain me. That's going to stain our perfection and find me a guilty criminal worthy of God's judgment and wrath. I mean, there's lots of people worse than I am. That's our human way of thinking, by the way. But church, that actually reveals another biblical truth, and that's this that God's standards and views are so high above ours? You know, we, we, uh, we kind of see sins as trivial, maybe not, not that big a deal, but God sees it as a very big deal. Whereas we see, again, sins not so bad, trivial, God's standard, his view is that Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul who sins shall die. God has actually pronounced a death sentence on those who sin. That's how high his standard is. His view, again, church, God takes sin seriously. And since he takes it seriously, guess what? So should we. Yes. So should we. 
Jesus then, he builds onto this foundation. He's building a foundation. He, he laid out our heart. He, he laid out then uh, our duty. And then he talks about how important the law is and that, and that we should cherish this law. He didn't come to destroy it, but then he continues. He reveals the true height and depth of God's view on the law. Look at 21 to 32. He says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, He's magnifying the law again. I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, in other words, you just don't like that person, shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, calls him a fool, calls him an idiot, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hands you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. For as surely I say to you, again, he's using that authority, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. But you know, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you than one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Yeah, by the way, if you're just kind of to digress, uh, rabbit trail for just a moment, if you're talking and you're witnessing to somebody and they say, well, I don't really believe in hell. The Bible don't really talk about hell. Take them to this. Well, what do you do then with Jesus who says, it will be better for you to rip out your right eye and cut off your right arm and go to hell with just one eye and one arm than, than to, to go to hell with both your members. How, what do you do with that if there is no hell? So it's not just enough to physically murder, Jesus says. It's not just enough to physically commit adultery, but God is omniscient. That means he is all-knowing. He knows all things. He knows your thoughts and he knows your intents. You know, people say, hey, listen, Christian, God knows my heart. You're right, he does, and that should terrify you. It should terrify us that God knows our heart. He knows all things. He knows our thoughts. He knows the reasons why we do what we do. He sees our thoughts of hate, our thoughts of unjust anger. He says, if you have hate or anger like that, it's, it's murder. God sees it as murder in the heart. And then he sees lust for another person as adultery in the heart. That's how high, again, God's standards are above our standards. We trivialize. God doesn't trivialize. In this section, Christ urges you and me to do the right and the honorable thing all the time. Do the right and the honorable thing all the time. Look at verses 23 to 24. Going back, he says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember your brother has something against you, just leave your gift there. Leave it before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So here, he commands us to first, we need to be reconciled to our brother or sister. Before we try and come and raise holy hands to God, if we're harboring anger, unforgiveness, and there's something against me and somebody else, I've got to make that right first. God says, you take care of that first, then you come and worship me. We've got to first seek peace with our neighbor and extend our hand to them if we want God to extend his hand to us. We've got to be willing to do the same. And then, concerning our, our wives and our husbands, be faithful. Be true to them. And you know why? Because you represent Christ to them. You do. There's been times I've had to tell my son and my wife, I have not represented Jesus well to you, and I'm sorry. Because I mess up. But we are to be, we are to represent Christ to them with our words and with our actions. And you know what? God is faithful and God is true. And because we represent him, you are made in his image, we are to be faithful and true. So don't seek after another man, don't seek after another woman, but be loving and committed to your spouse as God himself is loving you and committed to you. Our God loves you so deeply and so fiercely that he will not share you with any other God. Did you know that? 
He's not going to share you with anybody else. He's not going to share you with any other little G God. He's gonna, not going to share you with any idol. Scripture records God himself speaking in Exodus chapter 20, uh, chap, uh, chapter 20, verse 5. He said, you shall not bow down to them. Talking about little G gods or idols. Or serve them. He says, for I, the Lord, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. He is jealous for you. He's not going to share you just like I'm not going to share my wife with another man. God's not going to share you with anybody else. He loves you. He is committed to you. He says, I am a jealous God. And you know why? Because he created you and he died for you. Why would we be unfaithful to him? And church, this is how much God is devoted to you, and this is how much we are to be fiercely devoted to our spouses. So much so. And so now we're, we're called up from where we stopped in those first six sermons, and we come to our seventh lesson. You can, uh, again, you can go back to YouTube and watch in further detail the first six sermons, chapters, uh, chapter 5, 1 to 32. But now we come to the section on oath-taking. This is where you could say our word is our bond. Our word is our bond. You know, my grandfather... On uh, my dad's side, he didn't say a lot. He's kind of a quiet guy, but when he spoke, you listened. You might have a grandfather like that or someone they knew like that, that, you know, if they spoke, you listened. And he lived by this motto, say what you mean and mean what you say. He was a man of few words, but he said what he meant and he meant what he said. And that's the substance now of what Jesus is talking about right here. So uh, Matthew 5, let's look at verses 33 to 37. He, Jesus says, again, you heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, don't swear at all, neither by heaven, for that's God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So now in this section, Jesus is dealing with truth. He's dealing with truth. As God himself, Jesus is the embodiment of truth. Remember, he says, I am the way, I am the truth. He is building his kingdom on truth. And his kingdom citizens, therefore, must be truthful. We must always be truthful. Lies, deceit, half-truths, white lies, these actually have no place in the life of a Christian. Or not to even exaggerate. The fish was this big. No, no. We're, we're to tell the truth, always. Jesus, in his day, some of the scribes and the Pharisees, what he's really dealing with right here is that in this day, in his day, the scribes and the Pharisees had created a very elaborate system of non-binding oaths, or what they considered permissible lying. This section ties together the third and the ninth commandment, by the way. Third commandment warns, you shall not take the name of the Lord, Yahweh, your God, in vain, for Yahweh, the Lord, will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Very serious thing to take God's name. And the ninth states, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In other words, you shall not lie. So he's kind of tying these two commandments together. Making an oath or a promise and then breaking it is the same thing as lying and deceiving. If you make an oath, you make a promise, and you don't do it, you're basically a liar. And that's what he's saying. Therefore, breaking an oath or a promise is sin in God's eyes. But here Jesus reveals that this sin can actually be compounded and made even more severe when you swear an oath invoking the name of God. To make a promise or an oath or a vow, calling God to bear witness is binding. It's sacred. And God is not going to excuse the one who hastily makes such a vow or an oath. There was, uh, back if you'll find it in the Hebrew Scriptures in the Old Testament, a man makes an oath to God. He says, next person comes out that door, we're going to cut him into pieces. Yes, who came out the door? His daughter. He had to keep that oath. So it's a very serious thing to take an oath in the name of God. Hold your place. Uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes comes right after the book of Proverbs. So you've got Psalms, Proverbs. Then you come to Ecclesiastes. And listen to what Solomon says. Solomon, one of the wisest men who ever lived. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Amen when you're there. Listen to the words of the Lord uh, to Solomon. 
It says this, chapter 5, starting at verse 2. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you're on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity, and the fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there is also vanity, but, he says, fear God. Here in this section that Solomon writes, you can see the parallel in Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Back in Matthew 5, uh, verse 34, Jesus warns us, you know, do not swear at all. That's what he's basically saying. You know what? Don't swear at all. It'd be better if you just don't do it. Don't make an oath. Don't even make promises. Don't even make promises. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. As Christians, you know what? Our name and our word, it should be enough. If you tell somebody they're going to do, you're going to do something or not do something, you should either do it or not do it, according to what you said. We have to be men and women of, of unwavering character and integrity. The fact that we're Christ ambassadors here on earth, we should actually hold ourselves to a higher standard. I'm not going to lie to you because I represent Christ. And he doesn't lie, by the way. So how's your name, church? How is your name? If somebody hears your name, well, so-and-so said they would do this. Someone said that you would do this. How's your name? Do people go, well, if they said it, they'll do it. How's your character? That's what Jesus is asking here. When you tell somebody you'll do something or not do something, do people trust you? It's a question I can't answer for you, but you have to answer for yourself. Do people trust you? Do they believe you? You know, we shouldn't have to say... Okay, okay, I promise I'll do it. See, when you have to promise that way, that person is saying, I don't really believe you. Well, I promise. See, now you're making an oath or a vow. Or, I swear that I'll do it. Or, I swear that I won't do it. Our yes or our no, it should be sufficient. Right, will you do this? Yes. Or, are you going to do that? No. That's all we should have to say. Yes or no. And James, again, he counsels us coming alongside his half-brother saying, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. The scribes and the Pharisees, they thought that only an oath to God in his name was binding. That they could just kind of skirt the law of God. They'd get around it by making a hollow vow or an oath on other things. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'll swear by heaven. Or, I'll swear by earth or Jerusalem or even, I'll swear by the hair of my head. It'd be like children kind of making a promise and then having their fingers crossed behind their back. Oh yeah, I promise to do that. That's what they were doing. But Jesus revealed the heart of the matter. These hollow vows revealed that these people had deceitful hearts. They were full of lies and they were full of sin. And here he proclaims that this type of swearing was from the evil one. In John's gospel, Jesus goes into further detail where he says to the Pharisees, he says this, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Church, when we read Jesus' words, it should actually give us pause. It should just give us pause. When we read what he says, we should pause. It should send us into a time of inner reflection. Is he talking about me here? Do we represent with our words Jesus or Satan? Do you always tell the truth or do you sometimes kind of you know, bend it just a little bit? Do you tell little white lies or maybe leave out some details, you know? It's not really a lie. I just kind of left out some details. And I, and I did that so maybe, you know, I'll look better. Maybe I'll look innocent. So kind of bend the details a little bit or leave out something. Do you fib or exaggerate to make yourself seem better? Or maybe someone else seem worse? We need, 
And I say we because you and I, we need to examine our hearts and our motives because I guess what? God is always examining our hearts and our motives. Jesus saw the deceitful hearts of the religious leaders and he told them, you're of your father the devil. You're a, he's the father of lies. That's why you lie because he's your father. In church, God is truth. Jesus Christ is truth and he cannot lie. And our words and our hearts will reflect and represent one or the other. It's either going to represent God or it's going to represent the enemy. One of the two. There's no gray area, by the way. There's no middle ground with God. There are no loopholes, if you will. See, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were trying to find loopholes to get around it. But there are no loopholes with God. Jesus commands us, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything else he says, anything else from that comes from the evil one because you're trying to be deceptive. Someone asks you, well, do you promise? Do you swear? Our answer should be, no. My word is sufficient. I told you I'll do it, I'll do it. Or I told you I'm not going to, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to promise, I'm not going to swear. Because if we swear, or we make a vow, we make an oath, or even if you promise to do something and you fail to keep it, then we lie and we break the ninth commandment. We dishonor God. And if we promise or make a vow to God to do or not do something and we fail to keep it, we take his name in vain. Therefore, now we're breaking the third commandment. We're compounding it. So we need to be men and women of integrity. And I want to close with, close with this quote. I thought it was very profound. It says, evil men and women are not bound by oaths. They don't care about lying. Evil men and women are not bound by oaths, but the godly have no need of them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today, that your word challenges us. But it, not only does it challenge us to examine ourselves, but it challenges us to be better, to be godly, to be righteous, to be like you, Lord. And so, Father, help us to take your word and take the lessons that we receive from your word, Lord, and to ingest it internally so then we can express it in our lives. And, Father, may we be people of integrity, that when people ask us something that our yes is yes and our no is no and that they know that we profess Christ and as Christians we are people of integrity and of the truth. So Father, we ask, us, we ask you to help us in that today. To be men and women of the truth. May our words, may our actions, and our very lives point people to you. And we ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, friends.